The Spirit is your life. Romans 8, verses 5 to 11, New English Translation. For those who live according to the flesh have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their outlook shaped by the things of the Spirit. For the outlook of the flesh is death, but the outlook of the Spirit is life and peace because the outlook of the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to the law of God nor is it able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this person does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is your life because of righteousness. Moreover, if the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his Spirit who lives in you. I mentioned last month that Paul explains the gospel in the early chapters of the book of Romans, and we're still looking at how he does that. He outlines the doctrine of justification by faith in the grace of God made possible by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he explains that there's no other way to be saved other than by faith in the grace of God. Paul himself is the perfect example of the statement made by Peter in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. Once Jesus came to Paul, Paul was only about Jesus and his gospel. In today's text, Paul addresses the difference it makes in a person's life if that person believes the gospel and gets saved. If I were to show you a picture of a group of people, you'd probably not be able to guess from the picture which people are saved and unsaved. Some people believe there is no difference. They think the world is made up of all the same people. Christians may call themselves saved, but according to this view, they're lost like all the rest. Christians call themselves redeemed, but in reality, they're just as enslaved as all the rest. Christians can talk about having God's power, but they're just as powerless as all the rest. But in today's text, Paul addresses that opinion. He wants to show that Christians are different than non-Christians. He wants to explain what the difference is and how the difference transforms us into people who are not like everybody else. Paul describes two possible outlooks in verses 5 to 8. He categorizes the whole world into two groups according to the outlook that each group has. The first group consists of all the people in the world whose outlook is shaped by the things of the flesh. In Galatians, Paul says the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. When Paul says these sins are obvious, it doesn't mean that we will always notice them. We regularly hear of people who are caught in adultery or convicted of child molestation or rape or found to be addicted to pornography. And often it is the people that we would never suspect. We live in a world where it is possible to hide the thoughts of our minds. But if the things of the flesh shape the outlook of a person's mind, it will eventually show in that person's actions. If a person lives by lust, that person's relationship with others will be damaged and will result in his treating others as objects. If demons shape a person's outlook, 
her actions will reveal her devotion to those demons. If pride and jealousy rule a person's heart, that fleshly outlook will manifest in disrupted relationships and interpersonal conflicts. Those who live according to the flesh have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. We all have flesh, and our flesh is not evil. God created us as flesh, and we're intended to glorify God with our flesh. But if the flesh rules our minds, it produces an outlook that turns every possible good thing we do into an evil thing. The enemy is not the flesh itself. It is the outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. Paul says the outlook of the flesh is death. Such people are dead even while their body is still alive. They are dead men walking. They're walking the green mile. The result of such a life is death. Uh, people trapped in a fleshly outlook have a severely damaged relationship with God. God is their creator and heavenly father, but they do not acknowledge this. Instead, they are hostile to God. They are his enemy. They detest religion because it reminds us, us, them of God's existence. They don't want to hear God's word from the Bible because they refuse to submit to God's law. They are annoyed by people who want to please God because they cannot. There are billions of people in this world who are living according to the flesh. But Paul declares that there is another option. He says it is possible to live according to the Holy Spirit. He says it's possible to have one's outlook shaped by the Holy Spirit. The people who live like this are not walking the green mile. Their outlook is life and peace. They can obey the commands of God because their focus and concentration are on God and not themselves. Paul asserts that every authentic Christian is in the Spirit, verses 9 to 10. Remember, he said that there are only two possible outlooks. There's no fence for the people to sit on and remain undeclared. Either you're in Christ or you're not. You're either saved or you're unsaved. There's no third thing. There's no third outlook. Paul sometimes get distressed when uh, other Christians don't seem to live up to this ideal, but what he is talking about in today's text is the contrast between an authentic Christian and a person whose life is shaped by the flesh. He's giving a pep talk to the Roman Christians. He's saying that the world around them lives according to the flesh, but they don't have to. He says they're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. They have flesh, but their flesh is not the focus and concentration of their lives. The Holy Spirit is. He can empower them because they have relinquished their self-reliance. They were given the same choice as the rich young man in Mark 10, but unlike him, they chose to sell their possessions and come and follow Christ. Paul tells them they are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. God's Spirit lives in them, if that were not true, they would not belong to Christ. That is the message I want to share with you today. If you're saved, then God's Spirit lives in you. You do not have to guess at your salvation. You can know it. The evidence of salvation that Paul expresses here is not a theological doctrine. The evidence is the Holy Spirit's control, resulting in an outlook shaped by the things of God. The Spirit. That in turn produces the fruit of the Spirit. The hostility with God ends and is replaced by friendship with God. The reluctance to submit to the law of God is replaced by an obsession to learn and obey God's Word. And the inability to please God is replaced by faith, which gives us the ability to please God. Having established that there are only two outlooks, and each outlook will determine how a person lives, during this life. Paul's final instruction in today's text is that there will be a bonus for those who choose to live by the Spirit. Uh, 
Living by the Spirit also guarantees a resurrection to eternal life. Verse 11. Note the word moreover in the text of verse 11. That is a significant word in that text, in that context. It indicates, as I said, that there's an additional bonus to living life as a Christian. The spirit you entrusted to make your mortal life count for God today is the same power God used to raise Jesus from the dead. Note also how Paul changes the number of a particular word. In verse 10, he says, your body, singular, is dead because of sin. He's speaking of your mortality. If you don't believe you're mortal, I refer you to those who, who have come before you and are sleeping in the cemetery out there. This life is temporary. In a sense, we are all walking the green mile. But the good news is that the Holy Spirit within us guarantees that there will be a resurrection and that it will result in a permanent life. In verse 11, Paul says that God will make our mortal bodies, plural, alive. He changes the number to plural because the resurrection will not happen individually. We will all get our immortality simultaneously due to the same event, the resurrection. Non-Christians will not be raised to eternal life. They'll be raised, judged, condemned, and suffer the lake of fire, the second death. There'll be no resurrection from that death. It is just as permanent as our new life will be. It will be permanent death. But the gospel's good news is that no believer has to fear that second death. No believer has to doubt that they will inherit eternal life. We can be confident of our standing with God today because we live according to his spirit. The things of the spirit shape our outlook. God gave us his spirit by his grace, and as long as we are willing to let him rule our lives today, we need never fear tomorrow. The title of today's message comes directly from verse 10. It's a double guarantee. If you're a Christian living today, you have power for your life that the unbeliever does not have. You also have an inheritance promised to you that unbelievers will not share. Another life, an eternal life. God bless y'all. Have a great day.